Good evening again, all our friends from all over the world. This is Mohammed Zahran speaking from CEC. The CEC board would like to welcome you all for tonight's meeting. Tonight will be a very, very special night. We will be discussing uh, mitral registration in a very uh, interesting webinar. The first half of the webinar will be discussing the imaging part with the specific role of the three-dimensional transthoracic and transesophageal echo in the periprocedural evaluation for the mitral valve before mitral regurgitation intervention and during and for the follow-up of the procedure. I'm very glad to have on board tonight and to welcome my dear friend, Dr. Uzge Uzden Top cardiology consultant at Bashley Clair Memorial, Memorial Hospital from Istanbul, Turkey. Dr. Uzge will be discussing with us the role of the 3D transesophageal and, transos and transthoracic echo before the procedure for assessment of the patient fitness and selecting the patient for the procedure, intra-procedure for adjustment and post-procedure for follow-up. This will be moderated by my dear friends, Dr. Karim Mahmoud and Dr. Ahmed Saeed. Dr. Karim is the consultant of cardiology and cardiology lecturer at Cairo University. And Dr. Ahmed Saeed is the consultant of cardiology at Swedenborg Teaching Hospital. Second half of the webinar is not less interesting than the first half. It's actually very interesting. We will be discussing the percutaneous intervention techniques for the mitral regurgitation, also with a focus on the patient, with a focus on the data available, and with some tips and tricks and maybe some cases to show. This will be by my dear friend, Dr. Abdel Qadir El Manfi, Medical Director of the Structural Heart Disease Program at Mercy Hospital from Kentucky, U.S., and this part will be moderated by my dear friends, Professor Dr. Hagesem Stiman, cardiology lecturer at Fayoum University, and Professor Abrahman Gamel, cardiology consultant at the National Heart Institute. Then I would be lucky enough to give you a small wrap up at the end of this session. I'm very happy and I'm very honored actually to be with you, all of you tonight. And I would wish you all a happy Eid Adha, inshallah. And maybe. Uh, Dr. Uzge, you may start sharing your screen. Thank you. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and we can see you very well and your slides are perfectly shared. Thank you so much. So? Hello, hello everyone. Hello? Now, can I start with my presentation, with my lecture now? Hey? Yes, yes you may start. Yes, yes. Okay, you may please, start, yes. Please start. Hello, okay, I I'm starting you. now. Uh, you can hear us. Hi, welcome. Ready? Yes, I do. Okay. I, I, welcome. 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 We are glad and we are honored to have you both on board tonight. Yeah, welcome. Thank Thanks. Please start. Uh, now, Uzge. Let's move on now. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Ozge Ozdan Tok. I'm from Turkey. I work at Memorial Bacheliver Hospital in Istanbul. And I'm mainly interested in cardiovascular imaging, multimodality imaging, like uh, echocardiography, 3D echocardiography, interventional echocardiography, cardiac MRI, and cardiac CT, all of them. And uh, today I'm going to speak about metric lip, uh, metric lip uh, imaging. Just a second. Now I'll start with a short introduction, then I'll go with patient selection. And the biggest part of my presentation will, will be, of course, intraprocedural guidance. As we all know, uh, mitral clip is a percutaneous approach and it attaches both leaflets of the mitral valve 
and uh, it's made by cobalt chromium clips and it resembles very much the surgical alfieri stitch technique uh, which was first described by dr alfieri it's, it's really mimicking the alfieri stitch technique and it's been uh, more than 15 years now since the first matriclip experience and there are many articles on the topic like 1000 published articles even more and there are more than 70 thousand patients treated worldwide and more than 1000 centers in nearly 50 countries worldwide which means we are really familiar with the procedure and uh, we know the benefit of the procedure very well and uh, we know that there are two types of uh, clips now ntr and xtr um, what is the difference the difference is is the clip arms length at uh, 120 degrees and TR is like 70 millimeters, whereas the XTR is to, uh, 22 millimeters. Uh, and um, what is the benefit of uh, longer arms or what are the benefits of longer arms? Of course, it's, it means more leaflet insertion, more efficacy in Barlow's disease, easier grasping and reduced need for a second clip. But of course, we have to keep in mind that it means also a higher risk of tear of uh, tier of the martial uh, leaflets. What about patient selection? In, in 2017, there was a new uh, valvular heart disease guideline and the uh, martial clip was uh, suggested, recommended with uh, class 2BC indication level uh, for uh, primary muscle regurgitation for the patients who fulfill the echocardiographic criteria of eligibility. And of course, it has to be discussed in the heart team, avoiding the futility. And um, for, the, or, uh, for the secondary match regurgitation in patients with uh, left ventricle ejection fraction of less than 30%, who remain symptomatic despite optimal medical ter therapy and even CRT, and uh, uh, with no option for revascularization, it's again to be C uh, class of evidence. And in 2018, there were two important trials. One of them was co -opt, the other one was MATRA-FR trials. And in the co -opt trial, uh, um, among patients with heart failure, with moderate to severe, to severe secondary mitral regurgitation, if those patients were symptomatic, despite symptomatic despite maximum medical therapy, mitral clip uh, procedure resulted in a lower rate of hospitalization, uh, lower rate of mortality, better quality of life, and the better functional capacity than medical therapy alone, and within two years of follow-up. Okay, can you hear me now? Because I cannot hear no one. It's okay. We it's are okay. Here. Okay, yeah. perfect. I, I go on then because I I hear nothing. Okay. And um, what about the clinical selection? We all know that the more advanced the disease, the less beneficial is the treatment. And if the etiology of the mitral regurgitation is ischemic, if the patient has a New York Heart Association class four uh, symptom level at baseline, and if the left ventricle and systolic volume is more than 110 milliliters, if uh, the patient has a very high pulmonary artery systolic pressure and the chronic kidney disease, moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation and impaired right ventricular function, we have to be uh, aware of the reality that the patient will be hospitalized uh, most probably again, and um, the death rate is also higher. And uh, we all know that echocardiographic selection uh, is very important, and 3D echocardiography plays a very big, very important, crucial role for this procedure before and during the procedure. And what about the criteria? At the beginning, we were using the Everest criteria for the selection of the patients. But nowadays, we, we all know that it's outdated and it's all about the increased experience because uh, there are many centers now who are really uh, having a big number of uh, patients and uh, trying different patient types as well. So I cannot say that there are strict rules now, but of course, there are some patients who are really not uh, good candidates for the procedure. And I can tell you that experience center is very important and I will show you the uh, following slides, the importance of it. And I really owe a lot to Dr. Professor Inje where I learned this procedure. And uh, we can divide the patient groups uh, into three class, classes. 
Uh, first is optimum uh, valve morphology, second is conditionally suitable, and third is unsuitable valve morphology. In the optimal valve morphology, I will uh, tell all these details in the following slides, but I can say that the central pathology is always better, A2, P2 segment pathologies. And if there is no calcification, in the, if the marginal valve area is more than four centimeters square, and if the flail width is less than uh, 50 millimeters, and flail gap, gap is less than 10 millimeters, and uh, coaptation depth and length, I will go through those things again. So I don't want to lose time with those. And what, what about the unsuitable valve morphology? If we have a perforated or cleft marginal valve, if we have severe calcification in the area of the target lesion, in the grasping zone, if we have a hemodynamically significant marginal valve stenosis, Barlow disease, and rheumatic valve, those patients are um, not very suitable for the procedure. At the beginning, I told you about the experience centers, and we can see here some different patient series uh, from experience centers. One is from Ren, uh, Aaron uh, Donald and his team, where uh, they have a patient series with Barlow disease. And uh, there is also a series of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy with systolic anterior motion. They tried it in this patient group as well, which, were, which was helpful. And even in uh, patients with Alfieri, previous Alfieri stitch marginal valve repair, there is a patient series. So it's really very important to be an experienced center. And about cooptation, uh, we know that if uh, the cooptation length uh, where the leaflets are touching to each other, it has to be more than at least two millimeters. And cooptation depth is like that. It has to be less than 11 millimeters. Uh, those are the uh, criteria which needs to be fulfilled, uh, some of them. And the flail, if, the, if we have a flail uh, marginal leaflet, the flail gap is here, it's shown like that. And it has to be, the flail gap, gap should be less than 10 millimeters. And the flail bit in the, this is like an unfast view, let's imagine. It has to be less than 15 millimeters. And we have to be aware of the reality that uh, after the first clip, the marginal valve area get reduced by about 25 to 50%. And uh, after the second one, again, around 20 to 30%. And uh, we have to imagine and we have to uh, predict what will happen during and after the procedure. And of course, we measure the uh, marginal valve area with 3D MPR method. And I've told you about mean gradient. It is very important. Mean valvular gradient should be less than five millimeter of mercury with CV Doppler at the beginning and after each clip. And the mobility of the leaflets, uh, especially this posterior leaflet, the mobile part of the posterior leaflet should be at least 10 millimeters optimally. And those are some example from, uh, examples from our clinic. If, for example, we have a marginal regurgitation, severe one, if we don't do a 3D imaging, we cannot understand the morphology and anatomy of the marginal valve. And you can, if this is an unfast view, surgical view, we have the aortic valve at 12 o'clock position, which you cannot see very well here. It's like a smiley face. And uh, this is the lateral part. This is the medial part. And uh, this is A1, A2, A3, and P1, P2, P3. And we can appreciate the uh, cleft between P1 and P2 scallops. And even here in between A2 and A3 scallops, there is a deep indentation, almost a cleft. So this patient uh, is not a very good candidate for a microclip. But it doesn't mean that uh, there is no cases in the literature which uh, has been done uh, with, with this kind of clefts. There are, but less, of course. And this is not a good candidate, we can say. And this is an infective endocarditis patient. Even if we don't see, even if we don't have a very good image quality transthoracic in the transesophageal echocardiography, we appreciate the vegetation. And of course, we cannot do a magical clip to such patients. And this is, uh, I think this is the third case in the literature. This is not a uh, aortic valve, of course, but it looks like a Mercedes sign when it is closed. We can appreciate that it has three leaflets and um, we have 
uh, performed this uh, CMR scan uh, 10 days ago. And this is very interesting. And this patient had also a severe MR, but uh, you can appreciate how nice it looks. And this is, of course, again, not a very good candidate for a MR chocolate. We have to be very careful. We have to analyze the valve perfectly. And this is also a nice example for a challenging case. This is also Barlow disease. And uh, this is one of my favorite valvular heart disease group, rheumatic martial valve disease. I'm sure, pretty sure that you see lots of such cases in Egypt too, because in Turkey, in the developing countries, we see lots of martial stenosis accompanied by uh, other valvular heart disease like aortic stenosis, regurgitation. And uh, you can appreciate how it is opening like a fish mouth. This is the atrial aspect. And uh, now here you can see how it is opening like a hockey stick, the anterior leaflet. And in this example, it is like, again, hockey stick and posterior leaflet is almost immobile. We can say immobile. And you can appreciate how smoky it is, left atrium is. There is a spontane severe spontaneous echo contrast. And of course, such patients are also not uh, good candidates for mitral clip because First, martial, there is a martial stenosis, apparently, and the martial valve area is most probably less than four. It, it, it is less than four. And of course, posterior leaflet is not mobile. And this is how a martial, uh, rheumatic martial stenosis uh, martial valve area measurements looks like. And it's 2.5, which is not a good candidate. And you can see the sludge even at thrombus uh, in this left atrial appendage. Of course, we have to exclude left atrial append uh, appendix thrombi as well. And um, let's speak about the procedural monitoring. Uh, those two are how uh, the cat lab uh, looks like. And our cat lab looks more like this one, this first one. Me as echocardiographer, this one, I stand on the left hand side of the patient with my echo machine. And uh, the operators stand on the right hand side of the patient and our anesthesiologist is on the head side of the patient. We shouldn't forget to protect ourselves uh, from the radiation exposure uh, because most of the time we forget it, unfortunately, but we shouldn't. And let's start with the steps of the procedure. First step is, of course, interatrial septal uh, puncture. And we mainly use three images uh, for interatrial septal puncture. First is bicaval beam, like this one. The second one is short axis view. And uh, then I will show the third one in the next slide. It is four chamber view. In the so, bicaval. So, Olsi, uh, uh, thank you for this uh, nice demonstration of pre procedural planning. Uh, let's, uh, let's stop for a while and okay. talk about and talk about, um, um, let's summarize uh, what you have mentioned regarding which valve uh, would you choose not to intervene or not to uh, do a, a mitral clip for it? Yeah, as a summary, we can say that if the uh, lesion, if the problem is in the center, A2, P2, those are good candidates. If there is no calcification, it is a good candidate. But if we have a calcification in the grasping zone, if it is a rheumatic valve, it is a, if it is a Barlow disease, if you have a cleft or perforation, those patients are not very suitable for the procedure. Okay, thank you. And um, there is some issue I, I want to ask about, which is a primary and secondary mitral regurgitation. Um, and, mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to ask about uh, the way of differentiation between these uh, two pathologies and uh, how would uh, these pathologies would affect uh, the choose and the, the procedure detail and the outcome of the mitral clip. Okay. Uh, you know, it's the classification is Carpentier classification. And it has mainly three uh, classes, like uh, class one, class two, and class three. And uh, in the if we talk about functional mitral regurgitation, it is uh, either uh, ischemic, uh, if the problem is in the papillary muscle, or we have an annulus dilatation, or we have, let's say, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with a dilated cardiomyopathy. So uh, the valve looks like normal, 
but the pathology is uh, under the valve actually the ventricle is dilated annulus is dilated and papillary muscle is not working let's say so um we can say that Carpentier, in Carpentier 1, uh, if the annulus is enlarged, it is in Carp class uh, 1, Carpentier classification in the class 1. And uh, if we have a hole or cleft, it's again in the class 1. And uh, if the leaflet is uh, hypermobile, it's like Barlow disease, March of prolapse, flail, this is in the group 2. And if we have a, uh, if we have a for example, tethering problem, it's in the uh, class three and rheumatic valve disease also in class three. We can uh, roughly classify it like that. Of course, we have also uh, systolic anterior motion related MR and other classifications, but mainly it has three classes. And um, how it affects, of course, as I told you at the beginning, uh, the first Everest criteria, it was like for primary much, much for primary much regurgitation patients but afterwards, uh, after much FR and uh, co-op trials, especially after those two ones, uh, we have seen that we can utilize this procedure for this patient group as well. So it's, it's, it has shown that the mortality, uh, especially the hospitalization, quality of life, and uh, you know, um, those things were uh, better than the group, which was treated only with medical therapy. So now we are more encouraged for using MatraClip for the secondary uh, match regurgitation as well. Um, thank you, Oji. And uh, I'd like also to invite our, uh, our followers on the YouTube to forward their questions. Uh, one last question before uh, moving to the next part. Uh, you mentioned uh, that in some procedure you, you, uh, you use more than one clip. So is there predictor for using more than one clip uh, by echocardiography? Yes. Uh, if, for example, actually, we, uh, I will speak about that in the following slides, but uh, yeah. you have asked, it's a very nice question and important as well. I can tell you, um, if, for example, the analysis is more than 35 millimeters, if we have a functional match regurgitation, most probably we will go with two clips. So... Uh, we have to start from the medial part because it's like start from the medial and go towards the lateral and uh, most probably you will need a second clip and um, for the it is for functional match regurgitation and for for the organic uh, match regurgitation let's say we have a barlow disease okay uh, or much of a prolapse and um, of course we will put one clip to the pathologic segment but uh, we will need a second one. Why? To stabilize uh, the first clip and to increase the durability of the uh, first clip and both clips actually. And because uh, let's imagine that you have a Barlow disease and your uh, valve is really uh, like it has an excessive motion. So uh, with just one clip, your clip could, for example, be detached partially or total. So it's always good to add one more clip just uh, next to the first one to make it more st stable and uh, to increase the durability. Okay, thank you, Ozzy, for the comprehensive answers and uh, please continue your uh, nice presentation. Okay. And uh, as I've told you at the beginning, we start with the entire atrial septal puncture uh, and we use mainly three images, three views for that. First is by Kelvin view. The other one is next is uh, short axis view. Third is uh, four chamber view. And uh, in the by Kelvin view, uh, you can you can see here. This is a superior vena cava, interatrial septum, right atrium, left atrium, and uh, inferior vena cava. So uh, we tend to be more superior. Let's say this is the middle of the interatrial septum. We tend to be more superiorly. After we are satisfied with the superior inferior orientation, of course, we should shift the short axis view. And uh, in the short axis view, here is the aorta opening and closing. And uh, of course, we tend to be more posteriorly. Why? The most important thing is, uh, of course, not to harm the aorta, because if we cause, uh, if we, if we uh, have an aortic annular rupture, uh, it could be something mortal. It's very dangerous. So, uh, and going towards anterior means going to the aorta. So going posteriorly means uh, being away 
from the aorta. So we choose superior and posterior orientation in the interatrial septum. After we are done with this, we go to the four chamber view. And in the four chamber view, we use the four chamber view for the uh, puncture height actually. And we have to see this tenting very well. And we measure from the annulus, martial annulus to the puncture side. And uh, it varies they, actually, it's not a stable number. We can say that it can change between 3.5 and five centimeters, depending on the uh, kind of uh, mitral regurgitation. Let's say we have a functional mitral regurgitation, then in that case, our coaptation line, line uh, will be under the annulus. So uh, with a, a big tenting area, and it's better Let's imagine our tent uh, cooptation line is here under the annulus. We have to be a little bit uh, lower in the interatrial septum, septum. Even 3.5 could be enough in some patients. But let's imagine that we have a martial valve prolapse or Barlow disease. Uh, in that case, of course, our cooptation line will be a little bit higher and we, we will be above the martial annulus. So in that case, it is better to, cho to choose a higher uh, puncture site, like even five centimeters could be uh, acceptable uh, just to, to have a, uh, enough place for all the stuff inside the left atrium. So after we are satisfied, of course, we are uh, puncturing the interatrial septum and this is our needle. We are going into the right, uh, from right, left, right atrium into the left atrium. <clears throat> and this is, we can utilize 3D imaging here as well, but 2D imaging is <clears throat> most of the, sorry, most of the time enough. And uh, of course we will send our wire in, not into the left atrial appendage. Uh, we will send it into the left upper pulmonary vein. This is very important. And uh, we introduce our steerable guide catheter into the left atrium. You can uh, appreciate how uh, echogenic, echo bright uh, this stable guide catheter is. And during the procedure, whole, whole procedure, and at, at first we have the dilator in the stable guide catheter and we send it um, over an extra stiff wire, uh, and, which is located in the left upper pulmonary vein. And uh, during the procedure, uh, we want this steerable guide catheter to remain in the left atrium approximately 1.5 uh, centimeters. It is important. And the other important thing is uh, we have to warn, we have to warn uh, and we have to show perfectly to our international cardiologist the left atrial uh, wall, the free wall, because uh, there is a danger uh, of harming the left atrial free wall uh, in this step of the procedure. So we have to be very careful. And this is the advancement of the clip uh, delivery system. And you can see nicely how we uh, rotate and play with the catheter. And to my opinion, this is one of the most important steps of the procedure, alignment of the clip arms to the cooptation line. And um, if, for example, we have just uh, we, we are planning to put just one clip to A to P2 zone and uh, we need to be perpendicular to the cooptation line. And this is again an alpha sweep. This is the surgical view with the aorta uh, on top of the screen uh, at 12 o'clock position here interatrial septum, here LAA in the lateral position on the left hand side of the screen and A1, A2, A2. A3 from left to right and the corresponding P1, P2, P3 scallops. And of course, we want to be perpendicular to A2, P2 scallops with our clip. How, how can we provide it uh, with, to the echocardiography? There is a simple method for um, understanding it indirectly. Let's say indirectly because we don't see uh, with 3D at the moment. How can we do that? We can use the biplane images, and uh, one is the bicommissural view here, and the other one is the long axis view. In the bicommissural view, uh, or clip, uh, we, we shouldn't see any arms of the clip. Whereas in the long axis view, we have to see both arms of the clip clearly. This means we are uh, 
uh, perpendicular to inter um, to cooptation line. This is an indirect sign, let's say, because here this is a very nice example. This is from the same case. Uh, let's start from this. We don't see any arms in the bicomicial view, and here in the long axis view, we see both arms. Uh, remember what I've told you at the beginning. Uh, logically, we have to be perpendicular to cooptation line, and we are indeed. And uh, but here we don't see again any arms in the bicomicial view. This is okay, but in the long axis view, we don't see any arms again. We should see both arms, so we are not perpendicular simply. And uh, I've answered this question previously. And I told you if the analysis is more than 35 millimeters, most probably we will need a second clip. And uh, if we have a degenerated mitral regurgitation, uh, we have to stabilize our first clip. And for a longer durability, we have to uh, put another one next to the first one. An advancement of the clip into the left from left atrium into the uh, left ventricle. Um, for this step, there are two approaches uh, from different centers. Uh, at the center where, where I've learned this procedure, we were sending it when it is closed. But what is recommended is to send, generally recommended is to send it uh, when the clip, clip arms are open, but it changes from center to center. Again, I'm repeating. And of course, we want to understand, we want to be sure if the matrix clip device is still perpendicular to the cooptation line after we have sent it into the left ventricle. Uh, how can we do that? Of course, there are some tricks. What, what is that? The most commonly used one. Um, if we decrease the gain adjustment, uh, we can appreciate how the drop up, dropout effects are visible now. And um, it's like a lucid mitral valve. And we can appreciate, we can see uh, from the uh, left atrial aspect, uh, the left ventricular cavity, and we can appreciate that our uh, clip is still perpendicular to the cooptation line. And this is a good method to decrease the gain. Well, uh, next step is positioning our clip in the left ventricle uh, before the leaflet grasping. And uh, you can see our clip here in the long axis view. We, after we dive into the left ventricle, we, uh, we pull the device carefully a little bit back and we try to touch our leaflets uh, from the left ventricular aspect. And um, afterwards, uh, if we are sure that uh, we are in a good position, uh, the most exciting moment is coming. Uh, coming. It's the leaflets grasping and the grippers down and we close the, uh, we close the, uh, we grasp the leaflet, we close the clip arms. And of course, uh, leaflet immobilization and seeing the double orifice valve with 3D or uh, short axis in transgastric views uh, is important. Of course, we have to appreciate the decrease in the mitral regurgitation with different methods. This is after the, uh, this is, you can see uh, how it looks like, like a double orifice martial valve during the procedure, just before releasing the device. And of course, after each clip, we assess the mean gradient and it has to be less, less than five millimeter of mercury mean gradient, not the maximum one. And this is how it looks like after the first clip. And uh, I, I always show this slide. I like this one because this is like a always uh, opening and closing uh, its eyes. Uh, it resembles it very much. If, for example, we put just one clip, we generally see this uh, double orifice. If we, for example, put two clips, we will see three orifices. So, but if we put two clips uh, next to each other, of course, we will see again a uh, double orifice. And after each clip, we measure uh, with 3D planimetry NPR method, all mitral valve, small, all small areas separately, and we add them together. And um, at the end, the uh, final mitral valve area should be uh, greater than 1.5 centimeters square. And what is 
important is uh, to conduct the whole evaluation assessment in the same hemodynamic conditions. Let's say we have a patient uh, with, the, uh, with an initial blood pressure of one, 100, 140 over 90 millimeter of mercury. And um, let's say during the procedure, uh, after the first clip, we see mild mitral regurgitation, but our blood pressure is, let's say, 90 over 40 after some anesthetic drugs or so. So uh, will we trust that? Will we rely on this much regurgitation? If we do it on the following day, it will be a very bad surprise for us <laughs> because uh, most probably we will see at least moderate MR if it is especially a functional much regurgitation because um, if you if your blood pressure goes down, your much regurgitation will uh, will look less wrongly. So it, you will underestimate it. So. Uh, to provide the same hemodynamic condition with volume or other methods is very important. And uh, after your uh, procedure is done or after your first clip, uh, in addition to echocardiographic measurements, traditional MR evaluation, of course, uh, it is very important uh, to see the left atrial pressure and the, to measure the left atrial uh, V wave uh, it is very important to compare it with the uh, initial one, and of course to see to uh, to check the pulmonary vein reverse flow if it is normalized or no. What that, what do I mean? Let's see that one. Uh, those are left and right upper pulmonary veins pre-procedurally, and you can appreciate the flow reversal. This is S, and this is D. Normally, this is an after procedure. Normally, S is bigger than D wave in pulmonary veins. And if we see that, uh, most probably uh, we, we succeeded it. And uh, of course we will comp complete this with other imaging modalities and pressures and so on. But this is an important sign. But of course, if you have an eccentric mitral regurgitation, uh, it's not always the case that um, it changes because it's about the orientation of the flow as well at the same time, you have to be careful. And uh, after the first clip, we go with the second clip and uh, the uh, orientation of the second clip is mostly by fluoroscopy because we are trying to be as parallel as possible to the first clip, as you know. And uh, during the advancement from left atrium into the left ventricle, it's uh, under breath holding. We ask our anesthesiologist uh, to, to make a breath hold and uh, we close our clip the second clip and we sent uh, it into the left ventricle carefully. And the folding of leaflet tissue between two much clips should be avoided for sure, because otherwise we can create a bigger, greater much regurgitation. And both leaflets should be grasped and inserted into the clip arms and distortion and excessive tension uh, must be avoided. As I've been telling you from the beginning, mean gradient should be under five millimeter of mercury after each clip, uh, and the match lab area should be more than 1.5 centimeters square. But there is some um, exceptions. Let's say we have an old patient uh, uh, who is not very mobile, but symptomatic uh, from the much severe match regurgitation. If after the first clip, we, for example, provided uh, we succeeded to uh, reduce the mitral regurgitation, but not very much. But let's say our mean gradient, gradient uh, will be six after putting the second clip, but we will, uh, we will have a very significant mitral regurgitation. If the patient is immobile and old, we can even accept 5.5, six millimeter of mercury for the mean gradient. Of course, this is not a rule, some exceptions. Of course, there is, uh, you know, uh, the treatment always should be patient tailored. So we have to be careful about it. And uh, those are my last slides. And uh, this is a paper of uh, Dr. Nina Wunderlich and Dr. Siegel. This, is a, this was a very nice paper. And of course, it shows some complications uh, from magical procedure. Uh, I want to emphasize that doing uh, before each procedure, 
as a structural heart disease imager in interventional echocardiographer, you have to be very careful. Before starting the procedure, you have to uh, have at least two, three images from different uh, orientations. And uh, because it's very important to exclude any kind of pericardial effusion, uh, because for example, if you have very small pericardial effusion at the beginning, it doesn't mean anything if you have a hypotension and uh, pericardial effusion during the procedure. Whereas, for example, at the beginning, you don't have any kind of pericardial effusion and you have a hypotension during the procedure, even a very small amount of uh, fluid will uh, be meaningful for you because it's not about the amount of the fluid, it's about the accumulation rate of the fluid, as we all know. Uh, and air embolism uh, is possible because of the large sheets and thrombus formation I've seen two times. Uh, it's really uh, frightening and uh, we have to maintain an ACT of between 250 and 300 seconds. And uh, I told you about partial and total clip detachments, especially uh, if, the, if the leaflets are excessively mobile and atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, entrapment of cordae tendine by the mitral clip. This entrapment is uh, most of the time if you are putting a clip between A1, P1 or A3, P3, because uh, under A2, P2, uh, A2, P2 zone, in, the, in that zone, you don't have many cordae tendine. It's, uh, the entrapment is not uh, so possible. That's why... Uh, a2P2 zone pathologies are good candidates, actually. And another important and most probably the last point of my presentation is ASD. Uh, you know, if your patient has a right ventricular failure, a, a pulmonary hypertension, uh, you have to be very careful with your residual ASD because you have with the, uh, with the uh, left to right shunt you can deteriorate your right ventricle and uh, right ventricle can fail. So uh, it could be better after a successful magical procedure if your patient has a high pulmonary artery pressure and uh, bad right ventricular function. So it's good to close your uh, ASD after the procedure. And especially if you have a desaturated uh, patient after the procedure, uh, it's, you can do it ad hoc after the procedure directly and uh, follow up, up, of course, on the next day uh, after one month, three months, six months and 12 months. Uh, if necessary, you shouldn't hesitate doing a uh, TOE. You have to go with it if you are in a suspicion. And uh, what are the take home messages? Mitral procedure is rapidly evolving as an important option among the current therapies for MR. Clinical and echocardiographic patient selection is very, very important. And uh, 2D and 3D TOE play a major role in patient selection. And matricular procedure is 2D, 3D dependent, uh, TOE dependent for sure. And this is uh, my last slide, my drawing. It is something difficult as an imager, structural heart disease imager, but I enjoy it a lot. And I like helping uh, interventional cardiologists and my team. And I like uh, showing all kind of cardiac structures. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Uzbi, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, like, uh, I like your drawing so much. Uh, uh, you are famous for your etch art uh, all over the world on Twitter and on Facebook and uh, you explained most of the cardiology in a very nice artistic way because you are talented definitely as a human being as an artist and also definitely as a wonderful cardiologist uh, Thanks. I will pass the mic to Karim uh, first for some questions and also I would like to take some highlights from Abdel Adir regarding okay. uh, because he is a very very good structural heart disease interventionist and he's very good at teaming up with lots of teams so i know that he has uh, some comments so karim will go first and then abdel Adi will go so please go on karim uh, thank you dr Ozji, for uh, this excellent presentation uh, images and drawing everything uh, was super 
So I start uh, the questions with uh, the question from YouTube, uh, Dr. Dr. Paula Shohdi uh, asked about the mitral valve gradient. Uh, in cases of severe mitral regurgitation, we might face an elevated gradient uh, of uh, across the mitral valve. And uh, she mentioned that uh, we should not uh, proceed with if the mitral valve gradient is above five millimeter mercury. So uh, what about if the mitral, the mean gradient across the mitral valve is elevated due to the mitral regurgitation? Should we proceed or should we uh, abandon the procedure? Thank you for, this is a very good question and very important point to my opinion. Uh, yes, if we have, we have severe mitral regurgitation and the, because of the flow, really the mean gradients may increase. But of course, if we have a, a clear, uh, enough mitral valve area with measurements, uh, 3D measurements, because one of the other cr criteria is measuring the mitral valve area with planimetry. If we are sure that we have enough space and uh, the mean gradient is because of the mitral regurgitation, uh, I think we can move on. Okay, uh, this is a very good uh, point. Uh, I, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Oji, about the technical points of using the 3D echocardiography. Uh, in the cath lab, I think we use the live 3D as the most uh, the, the most uh, common methodology for assessing the mitral valve. Uh, but uh, are we using other uh, modalities such as a zoom 3D during the procedure? If there is an indication for using other uh, modalities such uh, 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 other than the live 3D? Yes, but as you have already told, uh, live 3D is the best because we have to see the immediate uh, instant changes of your devices. But of course, uh, I use, if, if I'm not uh, looking at the instant movements, if I'm just evaluating, let's say, uh, during his, my interventional cardiologist is doing something uh, which, is not, uh, which is not needing a 3D, in between, I can use, I do utilize uh, zoom, 3D zoom method to measure and to see uh, with different methods as well. I use it, 3D zoom okay. as well. Um, one more point with technical uh, use of the 3D during the procedure, which is uh, avoidance of the cordial uh, trapment by the, uh, the arms of the mitral clip. Which of you uh, would you use uh, to avoid uh, this complication? Uh, because it can uh, be associated with uh, uh, a failed procedure if we have a one or more cordial trapping uh, with uh, the mitral arm. So how would you be sure that uh, we don't have this complication? For the cordial entrapment, uh, I generally use the bicomicial view. And uh, I'm just trying to be sure that we are not uh, entrapped and uh, so Generally, I do use it. The 2D echo, not 3D echo. Yeah, 2D echo, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Okay. So uh, I'd like to hear comments from Dr. Abdelkader. Uh, Abdelkader then uh, return with one more final question. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Abdelkader. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, uh, uh, Mubarak, inshallah. Thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, Ozgi, you have done a great presentation. I learned so much today. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a lot of points you have raised uh, because you talk about the procedure. And uh, I have some in my slides and my cases I will show. I will reflect on your on your on uh, what you have uh, presented. And uh, uh, there are probably some different ways uh, of, of approaching uh, this, but uh, the imaging part you presented was really fantastic. Um, and uh, we will go over the steps, hopefully, once we pre present the cases. And uh, I'm sure more questions will come from, uh, from the moderators and from the aud audience as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdelader. Um, one last question, Dr. Ozzi, every now and then, we faced uh, a condition what, uh, what is called dynamic mitral regurgitation, a patient with pulmonary congestion and, and we have a dynamic changing mitral regurgitation. So uh, I'd like to ask you about your experience in visualizing and uh, this uh, type of etiologies 
and uh, if you have an experience with doing uh, such procedure with the mitoclin. Um, I don't have any experience with that group, but I've seen when I was uh, doing my observership in Berlin. Uh, but for myself, at my own center, I don't have any experience with that. Okay, uh, but you, you you might think that uh, you may think this uh, the mitra clip uh, would benefit uh, this patient. Actually, um, I'm not sure about it, but uh, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, Doctor Amafi would. Yes, okay. are you talking about the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy yeah. will be ah, a yeah. team, right? Is that what you're talking, Karim? No, yeah, I, I'm talking about the dynamic mitral regurgitation. Sometimes we have the patient with the changing severity of mitral regurgitation and the changing symptom with this uh, severity. Ah, okay. So uh, these patients, um, uh, there is a report that uh, they, they may might benefit from uh, mitral valve uh, surgery. So, uh, uh, do we have the data regarding use of microclip in this type of patient? Um, I, I'm not aware of any any data, honestly. But the only indication now that's rising um, uh, currently is the beside beside severe MR uh, for primary or secondary mitral regurgitation is the uh, MR associated with uh, with HOCAM or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I've also the, shown uh, there is a case series like that, yes. Yes, but uh, I, I don't know about dynamic uh, mitral regurgitation. That's something probably I will need to learn about. And uh, it, would be, it would be interesting <laughs> to, uh, yes, absolutely. It would be interesting yeah. to know more about it. Yes. So I'd like uh, to ask, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Olje for this marvelous presentation. Thank I you. Really it. Um, and if we don't have any other question, I'd like to pass the mic to Dr. Abdel Qadir to start his presentation. So please, Dr. Abdel Qadir. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen here. Uh, uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Abdel Qadir. Uh, this is Abdel Rahman Gamal. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, alaikum wa barakatuh. Uh, happy Eid uh, to you and to all our friends there uh, in the far north in uh, America. Inshallah. Uh, uh, it is honor to have you uh, today. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, our dear uh, friend uh, Ozgi for this elegant presentation. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Abdul Fader now uh, will give us another uh, amazing uh, one. Uh, regarding the steps and the tips and the tricks of the mitral clipping. Uh, Dr. Abdul Qadir is professor of interventional cardiology. Uh, uh, he is the medical uh, director uh, uh, of uh, structural heart disease uh, program at Mercy Health Hospital, uh, Kentucky from USA. Uh, I will pass uh, the mic uh, to him now to start his uh, elegant presentation. Welcome Thank you. Father. It is honor so to have you today. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just going to try to share my slides and let me know when you when you start seeing them. Um, okay, you can. Uh, I, I made you a co-host, so you have the green button down there. You can just use the share screen. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me just. Uh, I'm going to try to share my PowerPoints here. <clears throat> you need to open uh, the PowerPoint first, and after that, you will uh, use the share screen button down there. Yes. Uh, yes, and you can choose your uh, PowerPoint. Do you see my slides now? Not yet. You see, not yet. Okay, one second. Okay. Yes, we can see your laptop now. Do you see the slide? Yes, we can see a, a very big desktop with lots, lots, lots of folders, and then the yeah. slide that they're, they're all structured hard, <laughs> by the way. They're all structured yeah. hard. <laughs> yes, we know. 
<laughs> okay. Do, 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 do you see now the slide, the first yeah, slide? Yeah. Perfectly, perfectly. Okay, fine. perfect, perfect. So first, I would like to emphasize one thing about Maestro Clip, honestly. It's, a, it's as Ozgi mentioned, it's a 100% it's a image, imaging guided procedure. Uh, you cannot do a clip without TE. So basically, our interventional imaging uh, colleagues are the eyes and we are the hands, you know. Uh, actually, they are the eyes and the brains and we are the hands. So my interventional imagers tell me what, where to go and I just follow, follow her lead, you know, every time we do a Maestro Clip. So uh, uh, to start, you know, just to reflect back on, on, on mitochondrial therapy, I wanna uh, first, this, these are my disclosures. Um, I just wanna talk uh, about quickly about mitochondrial gestation because we have to, uh, we have to uh, acknowledge the attitude of the problem, the magnitude of the problem. And I know many, many uh, think that mitochondrial valve disease is a benign thing, but actually it's not. Uh, so it, it's a very common disease. The prevalence for mitral regurgitation uh, is age dependent. About 10% of people above uh, 75 have mitral regurgitation. And that could vary in severity between moderate to severe MR. So it's a very common problem in elderly people. And that's why mitral clip was actually invented because it was meant for those, to, those people who cannot, have, or should, or cannot have surgery or they have severe comorbidity that preclude them from having open heart surgery. Uh, etiology could be a primary, which is, means the valve is the primary affected structure, or could be a, a secondary or functional where the ventricle is dilated, uh, whether to, due to ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And we used to have to make this distinction because uh, we have mitraclib here in the United States was approved for valvular heart disease or uh, for valvular mitral gestation or a primary uh, MR, but not for secondary. Until COAP trial came out uh, uh, a year ago, and uh, now we have an indication in the United States here by FDA and by CMS for secondary MR. So we here in the US now we can do uh, mitral clip for both primary and secondary uh, mitral regurgitation. Uh, there is a high mortality for, for, for from from medical management, and uh, sometimes medical management uh, delay the uh, intervention because, as you know, when you give those patients Lasix, they might feel better but you are not addressing the actual problem. You're just uh, managing the symptoms with diuretics and other medications, but uh, uh, the actual solution for this problem is a, is a mechanical solution. It's a, it's, a, it's a valvular issue that needs to be addressed either by surgery or by transcatheter therapy to, uh, to improve mortality and, and, and save, save lives. Surgical risk and etiology determine the intervention and, and its timing. So every patient now, with, especially with the primary mitral regurgitation, we, we, we obtain surgical assessment to obtain the risk score. And they have to be very high risk uh, for surgery to be approved for mitral clip here in the United States. Uh, classification, as I mentioned, two types. This is the first one, whereas the uh, problem is actually the valve uh, and uh, uh, either the leaflet or the subvalvular apparatus or the uh, cordy or papillary muscles. Secondary is due to dilatation, mostly ischemic, uh, but could be also non-ischemic and lead to incomplete coaptation of the valve. This is the pathophysiology. As you know, increasing MR will lead to increased uh, load or stress on the ventricle, which is uh, volume overload, lead to muscle damage and fibrosis and leading to LV dysfunction and dilatation. The mortality, this is very surprising. The mortality for severe MR is up to 57% in one year. This is as bad as severe aortic stenosis. These are the three options we have, current consideration, either medical therapy, mitral clip, or mitral valve surgery. They go in opposite direction in, uh, in, in according to less invasive. So medication is less invasive than mitral therapy, and mitral clip therapy is less invasive than surgery. Also, uh, uh, increase MR reduction. As we know, still till today, mitral surgery is the gold standard. So when you have mitral valve repair, which is not attainable in every case, unfortunately, Mitral valve repair, surgical repair, typically give you a reduction in MR at 0%. Mitral clip, although it's a very uh, rising therapy and very uh, great device to have, and uh, I'm, obviously I'm very biased because I do mitral clip for a living, uh, it, it does reduce mitral regurgitation, but it, it does not eliminate mitral regurgitation. So I always tell patients, we can reduce your MR from four plus to maybe one plus. So if you end up with mild, mild mitral regurgitation, which is, which is fine, 
but it's not complete el elimination of mitral regurgitation. And it's not a replacement, as you know. It's not putting a new valve in, in, the, in the mitral valve position. This is the, the picture of the clip, how it looks. Uh, as you can see, there's a delivery catheter and there is a, a clip at the end. And uh, there is a gripper, and you have to clip, uh, you have to clip the, uh, the, uh, the mitral uh, leaflet between the gripper and the clip arms here and here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we, yes, yes, we, we can, can hear you. Go on, please. Okay. You, you can stop me at any point if you have any questions. Uh, you're welcome, okay? okay. Uh, sure, sure, dear. I'm going to mention quickly a, a couple of studies that we have uh, Everest trial, that the first trial we have for mitral, mitral uh, clip, and this was done many years ago, uh, where it compared device group with mitral clip versus uh, surgical control arm. And after the, this trial, Basically, mitral clip was approved for uh, for primary mitral regurgitation or degenerative MR. There was a clearly a uh, safety. Uh, uh, sorry for the slide; it's not clear, but there was a, a clear uh, superiority in terms of safety and bleeding uh, compared between uh, mitral mitral clip versus uh, surgery. Uh, and of course, we know about the famous uh, COAP trial, and Ozgi mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned some slides about COAP trial. COAP trial was a, a kind of a revolution for us to understand what happened if we clip or we treat mitral uh, secondary MR. As you know, secondary MR is not a good um, pathology for surgery, for open, open mitral surgical repair or replacement. Uh, it's actually class 2B. And um, uh, uh, trying mitral, mitral clip ther therapy was that was a, a really a challenge and was a, a very courageous step to take to, to challenge medical therapy to see if there's any difference in outcomes. So as you know, mitral clip uh, uh, approximate the anterior and posterior leaflets together, forming a double orifice as, as we know and called owl eyes. And uh, Osgi showed nice uh, um, um, uh, art pictures, which is really make, makes e easy to uh, understand. So the orifice is changed to two instead of one, but there are two smaller orifices. Uh, registers have shown or suggested that mitral clip uh, is safe and may provide symptomatic benefit to heart failure patients with secondary mitral regurgitation. We, we, we therefore performed the CAP trial, uh, this led by Dr. Greg Stone. Uh, he's the principal investigator of the trial. And they did this randomized trial to assess the safety and effectiveness of transcatheter therapy in heart failure patients and secondary MR compared to uh, guideline directed medical therapy. And this is the two arms, 300 uh, patients each, each group. Uh, uh, they, the one group received mitral clip and uh, guideline medical therapy uh, in the green, and the other one received only medical therapy alone. And the outcome was compared at 30 days, one year, and two years follow-up. And they were randomized one-to-one. Uh, -one. The, uh, the main uh, outcomes we have found from this trial is that uh, the number of hospitalization for heart failure over uh, two years post clip was reduced by 50%. So half the admissions was reduced in the clip arm. That means the clip will keep the patient away from being admitted with heart failure, uh, 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 with heart failure admissions. Uh, also, there was, there was a surprisingly out, uh, uh, difference in outcome in mortality. So, uh, uh, there was uh, a reduction in mortality, and the number needed to treat for mitral clip is 24, which is a very low number, actually, compared to other interventional therapies we have. And as you can see, the two curves are separating, and this separation is, um, is diverging as we go from uh, three months to one year to two years. So there is uh, clearly a survival benefit. Um, also, uh, there was... Uh, reduction in uh, old hospitalization even at the end of two years. You see the curve is, is now separating at two years follow-up. The conclusion for, for CRAP trial was in those patients with heart failure who have moderate to severe mitral regurgitation who remain symptomatic despite optimized medical therapy, transcatheter mitral valve repair with mitral clip approximation is safe and provided durable reduction in MR, reduced rate of heart failure ad admissions, and also improve survival and quality of life and functional capacity over the uh, to, to follow up in two years. 
So we have a therapy here that does not even reduce symptoms, but also improve survival and save lives. Compared to, as we know, uh, surgery is not helpful in those kind of patients with, with heart failure. As such, Clip is the first therapy shown to improve the prognosis of patients with heart failure by reducing secondary MR due to LV dysfunction. And based on this trial, we have indication now in the United States to treat uh, patients with heart failure uh, with mitraclib if they failed medical therapy. Uh, going to mitraclib procedure, which is, which is the main talk for me, I, I will go over the uh, steps for the procedure and then I will go over uh, three cases from my practice. Uh, so the first step, actually first step before even this is the case selection as Ozgi mentioned. And we typically we have uh, weekly, weekly structured heart conferences where uh, myself, the surgeon, the, the, uh, the um, interventional imaging, uh, we meet together after we finish the whole workup for a master clip candidate and we look for the case selection. And also we speak with our, our uh, industry partners from Abbott. Uh, they also go over the TE clips with us and um, sit together to decide what's the best approach for this case. Is this patient a clip candidate or not? Is this patient need one clip or two? What kind of clip, NTR, XTR, you know, now we have uh, 4G or generation four. So uh, selection of the patient is important for success. Uh, let's say we, we, we have a good candidate and we decided to go with mitral clip procedure. Uh, first step is vascular access. Typically I do my access uh, from the right femoral vein. That's the, that's the recommended access. Uh, there are some cases have been done from the, from the jugular in case there is no inferior vena cava, but those are extreme and there's rare. Uh, because everything will be different in orientation if you do it from, from a place other than non-femoral non axis. You can do it left femoral, but it will be harder. So the best option would be right femoral axis. We get access by ultrasound, uh, so we can you know, get quick access and safe. Uh, some people use a brick close for brick closure because it's a 24 French device. So you can use a, a brick close, one brick close. Or um, I typically, in my, my practice, I use a suture, uh, figure eight suture after we finish the case at the end of the procedure uh, with manual compression. So after vascular access, we can transeptal puncture. I used to do it with the uh, uh, broken burn needle as, as Osgi mentioned, but nowadays we shifted to something called Bayless. Uh, Bayless is, an, is another uh, device that helps us get access easily with uh, high safety and high ac ac accuracy. Of course, under guidance of TE, and I will show some pictures about Bayless uh, later on show cases. Uh, then we have to make sure we have room in the left atrium to manipulate and steer the, the guide catheters. If I see a case of mitral regurgitation with a small left atrium, number one, I doubt the diagnosis because you typically have a large left atrium to confirm you have a severe MR. Number two, I, I, I kind of come skeptical because I need to have a space to move my guide inside the left atrium. So the bigger the left atrium is the better to avoid any damage to the posterior wall, to avoid stuck at the appendage or you know, pulmonary vein. Um, uh, third, you have to obtain trajectory so you can go over, um, you have a good trajectory so you can face the mitral valve in, in a very good spot and this will, be decided mostly by where you get your transeptal. So transeptal has to be done in a certain way as Osgi mentioned, and I also, I will go over the transeptal um, uh, specifics uh, in, in a short, uh, short time. Uh, clip positioning is very important. That's the most important uh, step. Leaflet grasping, and then assessment of MR reduction before we, re we release the clip. So we, we typically grasp the two leaflets, and then we ask our, our um, we get relaxed because I, my, my job is over now. We ask our interventional uh, images to uh, do their part now by assessing how much MR have, have re we reduced. And this is very important because not every patient, we can achieve the same MR reduction. So we have to be also uh, very um, uh, uh, open with our uh, how much we achieved. Did we achieve complete reduction? We achieved partial reduction. Is the patient 90 year old or 65 year old? Is, is he active or not? So that will uh, tell me exactly whether I need to do a second clip or not uh, afterward. Uh, then we become to a decision where we need, do we need another clip or not? And the last but not least is the atrogenic ASD assessment to make sure we're not leaving a big ASD that we had to come back later and close it. So we have to look at how big is the ASD? Where is the shunt? Is it left to right or right to left? Is the patient hypoxic? 
and we can close it if we need to right there where we have uh, our, our equipment. And the last tip not mentioned here is the growing closure or hemostasis. Okay, the problem, uh, this is Haisim Soliman. Uh, yes. Thank you for uh, um, this uh, first part uh, with um, an elegant illustration of the importance of the mantra clip, its uh, role, and the step by step approach on how to perform a mantra clip procedure. Uh, you've mentioned the effect of the COAP trial on your uh, practice in choosing the mantra clip in order to improve survival of uh, patient with secondary severe mitral regard. Yes. Um, so I am curious when you're taking the decision of doing a mitral clip in patients with secondary severe mitral regard. Is it yes. from the start or uh, uh, now you have an option that, inc that improve mortality over the uh, medical treatment? So uh, the selection of these patients, is it from the start or uh, you also give a chance for medical treatment for, for a while? So, so typically, this, yes, this is a new thing for us because the COAPT was, was uh, published last year and then we have to wait for the insurance company and the Medicare to uh, FDA first to approve the indication which happened a few months ago. And then we waited for the uh, CMS with Medicare and Medicaid to uh, uh, approve the indication for financial reimbursement for the hospital. This happened only two weeks ago, okay? So now we have an indication that insurance covers and the hospital will, uh, will pay for the whole procedure for the patients if they qualify. Uh, that doesn't mean that we, we did not use to do uh, some cases in the past where they have a functional pathology, by, by functional pathology, meaning, uh, and Ozgi can comment about this, we have people who have combined pathology that in the past have a primary and also secondary in the same case, meaning that they have some sort of heart failure with the right ventricle, but they also have uh, um, uh, unhealthy leaflets. So we used to do this for, 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 uh, for by, um, what they call it, uh, 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 with, with, with double, double, double pathology basically. But now we can do it purely for heart failure. Uh, how we do it nowadays? We uh, we we are we are going to supplement our structural heart team with a heart failure specialist who actually deal with heart failure 100% of the time, full time uh, heart failure specialist. And those f physicians typically they manage heart failure patients with medical therapy and they optimize medical therapy and they try all other options prior to coming to MitraClib, including. Uh, uh, placement of, you know, referral for placement of uh, biventricular lead, you know, if they have a very wide com complex, um, you know, uh, QRS to synchronize the ventricle, optimize the beta blocker, optimize the diuretic, optimize the, the ACE uh, uh, or the ARP. And then we give about three months to see how the patient does with this medical therapy. If their symptom has improved and they are doing fine, then we can wait. If they are not responding to medical therapy, then we go ahead and, and uh, offer them mitoclip therapy for secondary mitral regurgitation. Okay, and uh, uh, is there a predictors for long-term uh, outcome with these patients that uh, favors mitoclip or not? So, so, so far we have the data up to two years, you know, the mitoclip, uh, the co-op trial data, but I think they're gonna continue monitoring those patients for the future. Uh, as you know, Many of the heart failure patients have irreversible pathology. You know, you cannot reverse heart failure. Basically, there is no cure for heart failure except you, except transplant, right? A transplant is not available for everyone. It's it's very limited. It's very complicated. And uh, prior to transplant, you have the LVAD as well. You know, the the uh, lymph nodal assist device. So those patients, our our goal is to uh, 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 help them with mitral to avoid reaching the stage of you know. Um, uh, uh, of course, the uh, LVAD or transplant, but we need long-term data. We need more than five years or 10 years. And for the time being, we do not have this data yet. We don't have this data. Okay, so you're performing the water clip in every patient that failed medical treatment after three months. Correct. We, we, have, a, we have a team approach, including heart failure specialist. Uh, we, may, we make sure the patient has optimized you know, medications and went up with the doses because there's a protocol that was followed in co-op trial 
for optimization of medication. And we follow that protocol and see if they respond, then that's fine. If they don't respond to medical therapy, then we can go, go ahead and offer the mitral, mitral clip therapy. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the access is okay, purely uh, venous. I want to add something. Yes. Possible. Uh, I'm not sure. Yes. It, there was a publication in 2019 uh, by Dr. Pecker and uh, his friends. And he was uh, telling about proportionate and uh, disproportionate much regurgitation. And uh, for uh, this is actually based on a table uh, with two parameters like left ventricle and diastolic volume and effective uh, regurgitation orifice area. And uh, according to this table, if our patient uh, has a disproportionate much regurgitation, then those patients are more likely to utilize to have a benefit from this uh, much blood therapies, actually. Otherwise, uh, if the patient has a proportionate much regurgitation, uh, it is uh, better to try uh, inhibitors of brain angiotensin system and beta adrenergic blockers and the cardiac contractility modulation, so left ventricle yeah. assist device. So there was something, this is something new in 2019. And uh, I just wanted to mention it. Yes, so uh, actually, if you look at the, uh, uh, the other trial that failed, it's called Mitra, Mitra, Mitra France that you mentioned. So there's two trials, Mitra Clib and Mitra France. Mitra Clib was a successful trial, very impressive you know, results. Yeah. Mitra France was a negative trial. And we looked back and we found that the, the selection of cases for heart failure was different in those two trials. So probably the Mitra France, they were doing cases that were too advanced heart failure, too sick to be fixed, and, or too late, basically. You do a clip, it doesn't work. So you have to pick your time where you can intervene on the heart failure patients where the LV is not too much dilated, basically. So I, I, I look at those two trials not as an opposite each other, but I look at the trial, the trial as a, although the results were, were different, but uh, COAP showed me the patient that we should do a clip, and Mitra France showed me the patient that we should not do Mitra clip on. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abdel Adir, for uh, clarifying this point about the patient selection also raised by Dr. Uzge, because you don't need to wait for the patient until it's very late, and then you perform the procedure, you will not get benefit. But I think the 2020 and the 2019 and the 2018 patients are very much lucky because on the medical therapy, they have the new uh, sacubitril, valsartan, and heart failure, they have the mitral clip procedures. They previously have uh, the CRTD devices. So actually, they have lots of options, but they need to be intervened upon properly in a timely fashion before they develop the complications and the irreversible downhill of heart failure, as you elegantly demonstrated. So uh, I think it's time to complete uh, with the cases now because it looks very interesting. Sure. So I had the first case here. It's an interesting case, 87-year-old male who presented to our emergency department with sudden onset severe chest pain, orthopnea, PND, bilateral leg edema. And he has a very limited best leg history, hypertension, osteoarthritis. So he's not known to have any, any heart failure before. This is the first time he presented with heart failure. Uh, his chest x-ray showed pulmonary edema, so a straightforward congestive heart failure acutely. AKG showed no ST elevation. Uh, his lab show, was normal, except uh, creatinine was 3.9, so it obviously was his, his renal failure. And we presume it was acute because he's not known to have a renal problem prior to this presentation. His echo showed severe, uh, um, severe MR. His ejection fraction was 50%. His MR was eccentric, and the JIT was directed anteriorly. Um, uh, he has a pulmonary vein systolic reversal, and his RVSP was about 80. So he, he was meeting all the criteria for severe MR, uh, which is the first type, which is the degenerative mitral regurgitation, uh, because his LV function was normal and his valve anatomy was abnormal on TE. So uh, his TE showed severe MR, partially flailed P2 segments, and the cord was torn, uh, no PFO, no left atrial bench clots. So those are two important things you need to uh, do up front to look for anatomical suitability of mitral clip. It's not only the, the mitral valve itself, but the whole anatomy. Uh, make sure there's no PFO, and you have to avoid this PFO when you do uh, a transeptal 
and make sure there's no clot in the appendage uh, to, to delay the procedure or make sure you, you don't cause a stroke when you do the, the mitral clip. So this is his, his, uh, his, his, his images, as you can see, it's very obvious. Uh, there is a, a P2 flail. That's the uh, mitral jet here. The jet goes anterior toward the aorta. That means the pathology is the P2 or posterior leaflet. This is a, a, two, two, a, a 3D image. As you can see, there's a, there's a, a very severe prolapse there. Uh, this is reverse, so I'm going to give, this is the actual, uh, um, they call it a surgical uh, view, I call it interventional view, I'm just biased by, by intervention, so uh, this is the anterior on top, the posterior on the bottom, so it's P2 is the, uh, is the flail there, and there's a mild TR, as you can see here, the septum looks okay, and the aortic valve looks uh, uh, healthy, so he received medical therapy originally, uh, initially, and he was stabilized with IV diuretics, but his kidney function, of course, you know, worsened and his ketamine went up to 4.2 uh, because of uh, excessive dialysis. We consulted CT surgery on him. Of course, he was uh, 87 year old and he has renal failure. And now with heart failure admission, his STS score was 15.9, so about 16%. So it's a very, uh, very high, high risk for surgery. And the surgeon said, we cannot, you know, we would, would rather find something, you know, less invasive uh, on this patient and less risky. So we did right heart cath, we measured the pressures, as you can see here with the swan. And then we do a coronary angiogram routinely for every mitral clip candidate to make sure there's no significant coronary artery disease. As you can see, he has a, he has a tight lesion in the, in the uh, circ territory that was uh, immediately treated here uh, with angioplasty, ballooning, stenting. And this is the, uh, this is the circumflex now treated but of course, this will not, I'm not expecting this to fix his mitral regurgitation because uh, if, it was, if it was because of functional MR and, and heart failure, I would say yes, revascularization might help. You have to wait a few weeks or maybe months to uh, see the results. But this patient has a problem in the anatomy of the valve. So you have to deal with the valve. Fixing the coronary arteries probably will not fix the, the, the mitral regurgitation. So we did a TE afterward, his MR is still the same. This is the, this is the flail uh, uh, leaflets. This is the uh, uh, intraoperative imaging. So after we obtain access, uh, we decided to go for, uh, of course, transeptal. This is another image for the, for the jet here. So when you do transeptal, you have to measure your height. You have to, uh, you, you would like to have a stick where you can stick the septum and puncture uh, high and posterior, high and posterior. So the height is determined by four chamber view as Dr. Osgi mentioned earlier. And uh, typically you have, your best bet would be if you get something above four centimeter. Uh, if you get 4.5 or five, that's even, even better. Um, but uh, four is your, your kind of where you want to be. You don't want to buy 3.5 or three because that will have difficulty steering your guide and obtaining trajectory. So as you can see here, we have good height. We measure from the puncture side all the way to the mitral coaptation level. And then once we cross the, uh, cross the septum, typically we used to do in the past, we used to put uh, Amplatz wire in the pulmonary vein. I, I kind of changed that practice now. I do put, uh, I use, the, uh, use this wire. This wire is a loop wire, pre formed uh, it, it, it's, uh, you can obtain this wire from Touré. I think you guys do a lot of mitral stenosis. This can be part of the uh, uh, Touré uh, tray, or you can also find this wire with the Bayless uh, or Safari wire for the Taver. So this wire enabled me to do many things. Number one, this wire is in the, in the atrium. It's not in the pulmonary vein, it's not in the appendage. So I feel safe now pushing equipment over this wire. This wire will not puncture or perforate anything. Uh, if you want to do balloon uh, septostomy, because the septum is thick, you can balloon over this wire. And you can advance your guide catheter, big tail, whatever you want over this wire safely. Um, here in this case, the septum was a little bit thick, so I have to do a simple balloon septostomy, septostomy with a, with a uh, eight millimeter balloon, just to make sure the, the guide catheter will go easily uh, across. We do not do this routinely for any case, except when we have 
a thick septum or you have difficulty advancing the guide, the mitral clip guide catheter. And now we have the, we have the guide across and we are steering, uh, we are ready to cross the, uh, cross the, uh, the mitral valve here, by fluoroscopy, but everything we do under, from now onward is actually happening under TE. So I look at fluoroscopy just to make sure where I am, but uh, I see everything live on TE images and I know uh, where I am above the valve, at the valve, below the valve. One step I need to, I need to uh, emphasize here, uh, I think um, there was a question about it earlier. When we cross from the atrium to the ventricle, we cross an open position. We open the, 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 leaflet, the, the leaflets or the arms. But if we want to reposition and we come back to the atrium to readjust our position to, for a better grasp, we invert the clip down. So we, we guarantee that there is no cord that's attached or, 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 uh, or um, uh, uh, you know, a coat on the clip because that can cause the uh, problem, cause severe MR if you pull the clip back while it's, uh, it's semi open or, or open. You have to be inverted. So you have to be, uh, sorry, uh, everted down. Now we are, uh, we are in, on, uh, on top of the mitral, mitral valve now. As you can see here, we have a uh, perpendicular position. We are at 12 position here. The valve, the valve uh, levels is horizontal and the clip is actually perpendicular to that. We call this position as a 12 position. This is your best bet to catch uh, A2B2 pathology. And you are now, you're ready to cross the, the valve. So this is called end phase. And uh, my imager will tell me exactly how I am doing so I can move my, my, uh, my buttons to change the orientation until we have perpendicular alignment with the valve before we cross down to the, to the ventricle. Now you see the clip here under TE, the clip is actually above the, above the mitral coaptation level. So in this view here, so I'll go back in this view here, as you can see, we have a good, we have good uh, grasp and we have reduced the MR. The clip is not released yet. We are doing assessment here to see how much MR we left. We almost, there is nothing there, uh, maybe a trace. And we check everything. We, uh, we take our time. We check the uh, MR reduction. We check the uh, MR gradient. We check the uh, flow reversal in the pulmonary vein. And uh, we make sure we don't need a second clip. Or if we are not in a good spot, we can release and re uh, uh, get the clip back to the atrium and recross again and find better grasp. So by doing this maneuver, you might be able to avoid putting second clip actually. And if you wanna do a second clip, as Ozgi mentioned earlier, you have to put your clip more immediately so the second clip can come lateral in this position. Now the clip is released and it's stable. It's not you know, uh, flo floating around and the guide is still across the transeptal. I keep the guide for a few minutes to see uh, if I need second clip. Uh, because if you pull the guide back, you need to recross again, and it's, it's another another uh, um, hassle. But you you should keep the guide across the septum until you do a further assessment after you release the you the first clip to decide whether you need a second clip or not. This is the MR reduction here. It looks good. So this patient did very well. He went out of the hospital. Uh, he came to the office uh, for for uh, for a one month check. Uh, we do an echo after one month, transthoracic echo. There was a trivial MR, his mean gradient was three, and his actually RVSP improved from 80 to 45. So there was a reduction in his right side pressures. And this is his echo after one month, the 2D echo. The almost, there's no, almost uh, no MR coming back to the, uh, to the uh, MR jet to the atrium. Another view here, four chamber view, complete reduction of the mitral regurgitation. Out rate of 57. And the biggest news is that he is off dialysis. He, got, uh, he was in dialysis for about six weeks, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, hemodialysis. And, uh, and when he came to see me with, uh, at, the, at the visit, he, his nephrologist said he doesn't need dialysis anymore. His kidney has recovered. So basically with mitral clip, you fix the kidneys as well because the renal failure was due to severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, can I stop you here, uh, dear uh, Prof? <laughs> Dr. Abdul Qadir, you hear me? 
Yes, I hear you. Any any questions? Yes, please. Uh, actually, uh, I'm uh, got excited. I'm sure everyone here and on the YouTube is also excited. We have the best team uh, now for uh, mitral clipping in the world, uh, Dr. Ozgi and you. But uh, I want to pass uh, the ball to Dr. Ozgi now, and you should defend uh, <laughs> the attack. Uh, I want to ask here, here, here uh, do, do, you, do you see that uh, uh, this mitral regurge is a primary mitral regurge or a secondary mitral regurge? In other words, uh, 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 the uh, COAT trial is American and Canadian trial, so uh, uh, they included uh, both mitral and non, uh, sorry, uh, they included ischemic and non ischemic mitral regurge. Uh, what do you think that this mitral regurge is a secondary mitral regurge from the start in this case? Uh, we can't hear you, uh, Ozgi. Sorry, I, I was muted. Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, if we go back to the first images, maybe we can appreciate better. Yeah, I just want to see all of them again. Yes. So uh, this is the first uh, echo we did. Uh, one second. This is the TE. Uh, yeah, I think this is more like an organic MR, P2 prolapse, right? If yeah. I'm not wrong, yeah. Actually, there was a torn cord. There was a torn cord. Yeah, this is like a Carpentier class 2 mitral regurgitation. Organic one. Uh, uh, is it mixed types of pathology or just organic mitral rigor? From here, I can say because uh, I think left ventricular systolic function was normal. It looks normal, right? Yes, I'll show you some yes, pictures of LV. And I'll show you the LV pictures here. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's see the systolic function. Yeah, it was normal. It was, it was about 50, so it was low normal, I would say 50%. Yeah, I think it's low, borderline normal. Yes. And uh, the analyst also doesn't like look, doesn't look like enlarged. And uh, I think this is something like a pure organic match regurgitation, to my this opinion. Is the, this is the other picture, uh, 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 Dr. Osgi here. This is the... Uh... Here, here, it's very clear. Yes. So you think it is pure organic mitral regurgitation uh, and the ischemia uh, had no influence on this one? Yes, Dr. Abdul Qadir? Yeah. Yeah. Correct, Dr. correct. Abdul yes, correct. I agree. I think ischemia, maybe the ischemia contributed to heart failure. But it did not contribute to the MR. The MR was the uh, was cyber pathology, and the ischemia was cyber pathology. Mm -hmm. And uh, typically, you know, this is a new concept for us as a, as a as a structuralist. Typically, in the past, when the surgeon opened the opened the heart for you know for mitral aortic surgery, they used to do a you know ask us to do a heart cath and fix you know any significant lesions with cabbage prior to in one go in one open heart surgery. For us now, as a, as a TAVR operators and, and, and mitral clip operators, we start looking skeptical. At the beginning, we used to fix every lesion before the TAVR or mitral clip. Now, for the TAVR, we fix only those who are very significant, like proximal LED, left main, or proximal RCA, or a dominant circ. So the concept of doing every, every, every coronary lesion prior to structural heart is becoming less and less. The reason is because our procedure doesn't have much burden on the heart because it's done minimally invasive. There is no heart-lung bypass machine. There is no, uh, you know, uh, 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 risk of hypoxia and 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 damage. It's very mitral clip is a very safe procedure, and I can I can attest to some data later or, or maybe in next meeting. Uh, it's one of the safest procedure, uh, uh, and I know many surgeons now like us to try mitral clip first because they say. We can go even do a mitral surgery after mitral clip if it, if it fails. It's like putting a stent, and then if it fails, you go to cabbage, you know. So, yeah. but, but the nature of uh, less invasiveness make it favorable to everyone on the team and also to the patients. 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Abdul Qadir. It was a fantastic case. Uh, now uh, we are also excited to uh, hear from you uh, the second case. And so uh, second case, uh, sure. Second case, I'm just going to be brief. I'll show the steps only, uh, not much clinical details. So uh, this patient, uh, the two cases, next will be, will be just a quick uh, steps for the procedure. So next patient was a 87-year-old uh, male who referred to us, our pharma clinic with severe MR. Again, he has high stage score because advanced age, close to, close to 90, and comorbidities. So the surgeon uh, declined the patient for mitral valve surgery. As you can see, this is the, uh, this is the TE pictures. Very wide jet. So I'm going to stop the steps here. So uh, this is the, uh, the uh, uh, Bayless wire where we, after we cross, Bayless basically enable you to cross with just touching the septum and tenting, and then you press the button to uh, to do the uh, uh, to uh, 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 induce electricity that across the needle that perforate the needle through the septum straight away. So there is no bush, there is no pressure uh, like what you do with uh, with the broken brain needle. Uh, it, it's a very simple and very safe uh, transeptal technique. So after we did transeptal here with the Bayless, Bayless uh, uh, wire. And then next we did, uh, mm -hmm. this is the uh, clip here, XTR coming across. And now it's directed toward the left pulmonary vein or the appendix. So we have to get our trajectory down toward the mitral valve this way. So we have to watch under TE while, and, and fluoroscopy while obtaining that, uh, that you know, uh, uh, accurate trajectory. Uh, sorry, Dr. Abdul Qadir. Uh, uh, I want to ask you: uh, You uh, didn't uh, do uh, dilatation here for septal dilatation here? No, uh, we did not. Yes, uh -huh. we did not because the septum was thin, and uh, the, I did not anticipate any trouble going going through with the with the with the twenty four French guide. Uh, okay. uh, typically, this guide it comes on a dilator and goes over the over the wire. When the wire is looped, it gives you actually more, more tension and more power to push uh, the dilator and the guide across. Once you're across, the TE, uh, our TE partner will tell us where we are in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the atrium. I would like to be in the midway, not too far in the posterior wall. So I would like to, to see at least two centimeter of the guide inside the left atrium. And then after I see that, we just start, you know, getting the wire out, getting the dilator out, and then advancing the clip. Okay. Okay. If you have less than two, two, two centimeters, sometimes when you pull the guide back, when you pull the dilator back and the wire, your guide might come out on the right atrium, which is which is a problem. So you have to make sure you have at least two centimeter inside the atrium. So that's why the atrium has to have enough space to uh, keep the guide inside the atrium. Now the clip is actually toward the mitral apparatus. This is a clip actually XTR, by the way. It's the long, uh, and now the clip is being released uh, at, the, at the position for the, um, for the uh, after we obtain a uh, good reduction. And now the guide is out and the case was completed. This is his uh, echo here, as you can see. So this is the this is the MR after the first clip. Oh, sorry, one second. Let me just. So this case I used only one clip, and I'll show you a uh, third case where we needed to use two clips. This is one clip case, and we achieved uh, good results here. So we were happy. Next case is a 77-year-old male who was diagnosed with severe MR, uh, came to valve clinic, same thing, um, uh, high surgical uh, uh, score, and uh, we uh, decided to proceed with mitral clip therapy. Uh, transeptal here, you have to basically tent with the needle, as you can see here. You do a transeptal, uh, um, basically um, tenting, and on the tent, you measure all the way to the uh, to the valve perpendicular, uh, you know, uh, coaptation line, and as you can see, we have 5.5 centimeters, so which is really good. We're, we're high enough, and you make sure you are posterior. This is the aorta here. 
So you are posterior enough. Uh, so you are away from the uh, from the from the uh, uh, PFO. You are away from the aorta. And as you can see here, the the indication that you crossed is you see a, you see a bubbles across the atrium. So there's no bushing here. We just press the button after you tend to the septum for the for the bailis, which induce electricity, and that will uh, cross the small needle across. And then you introduce your wire and you finish the case. This is the uh, picture of the uh, MR here. As you can see, it's a very severe MR, just by by, by color jet. Mm. Now we have our first clip here. We are uh, doing the in-face picture with, uh, with the 3D imaging. First clip now is being, uh, we have a grasp and still attached here. We are assessing how much reduction we have the MR. So as you can see, we reduce the MR significantly, but there's a lot of jet here. There's still significant jet. Uh, the good thing we did, we kept the, this clip medially. So the jet is actually left lateral. This is lateral, this is medial, uh, because this is the appendage here, the circumflex artery, and the left atrial appendage, so this is lateral, and uh, this is the left upper pulmonary vein. So the jet is actually left is, is lateral, which is easy to man manage with the clip, uh, second clip. So now second clip is coming, you can see the first clip here, the second clip is beside. And now we're trying to, uh, to uh, grasp the anterior leaflet. We already have a grasp on the posterior. We try to grasp the anterior over the clip arm, which is open. Now you can see here, there's two clips side by side. This is the medial or the first clip. This is the lateral second clip. And now we have almost uh, zero MR. I mean, there's a trace MR to, 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 to say that at least. Um, this is the uh, assessment for the MR. Uh, you put the cursor on the left outer pulmonary vein here to see the uh, uh, the uh, systolic flow reversal is, is, is gone. And also you check the gradient. And here after two clips, we have a mean gradient of four. So this is really good because if you have a gradient of five or six after the first clip, we should think twice before you put a second clip. But as you see in this case, we have put two clips and we have a mean gradient of four. This is a close uh, picture of both clips side by side, and you see there's a trace MR compared to the previous jet we had, which was uh, uh, severe. So this is conclude my presentation, and I would like to thank you so much for this. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Abeder. Uh, I would like to ask you first, and then I will ask Osgi as well, because you said that uh, somehow the cardiac surgeons may say, okay, uh, you can go with the intervention first, and after that we can do the mitral surgery. So let me ask you, what is the, how much is the cost uh, in the U.S. now for the whole procedure, including one clip package and two clip package? So uh, the mitral clip, I think now the cost is about thirty grand, thirty thirty thousand uh, dollar. But yeah. the good thing about the mitral clip is covered by insurance, hundred percent. So, so our, our, our patients uh, get the clip, the insurance pay for the whole procedure. They are already insured. Yeah, uh, the second thing is that uh, when you buy the clip uh, device from Abbott, they, buy, they sell you a catheter and you have up to three clips to use for free with that, with that, with that catheter. Meaning that you can use up to one, one clip or two or three in, per case without any added extra charge to the patient or to the hospital. That's very good. Uh, what's the situation uh, in your hospital, Uzgi? In my hospital, the total cost is approximately like uh, 25,000 euros for for each patient. Yeah, and it's it's covered by government no, or insurance no, or no. Pri yeah. privately paid? No, at the beginning it was covered, funded by the government, but now not. No, it's not. No, it's unfortunately, this procedure is only for the rich patients in Turkey, unfortunately. Yeah, or in, in Egypt as well. That's why I was asking uh, Dr. Abedir. The second question for you, Dr. Abedir, say you are now the director of the Structural Heart Disease Program and you are training your uh, consultants or fellows or specialists or whatever. Yes. Uh, after how many cases you think they need to uh, 
learn as a second hand operators before they perform the operator as single hand yes so um uh, mitra clip is is a uh, is a compared to taver let's say taver is the backbone for structural heart uh, uh, yes. taver looks very simple compared to mitra clip number one because the steps are less number two uh, there's not not much dependency on te and understanding the anatomy uh, be, uh, because TAVR is easier, and we have a lot of experience with BAV in the past, balloon valvoblasty prior to TAVR. Mitra clip, a uh, little, little bit complicated because it need, needs uh, not only the handling of the device, the device is a complex device. It, it has a lot of uh, steps, uh, and um, a learning curve is probably a little bit, little bit uh, uh, well, longer for Mitra clip compared to TAVR. Uh, do you agree, Ozgi? Yes. I totally agree. Yeah. So I and think the number of cases procedure needs a 3D dimensional imagining of the left atrium, the transeptal, yes. and everything. What we yes. do it in percutaneous mitral uh, commissurotomies for uh, for yes. mitral stenosis a lot in Egypt. This is not a big deal, but I mean the as you said the device complexity. How yes. long so do I, you need I, the I, learning? I think curve? doing 20 cases, first 20 cases, you know, as assistant, uh, yes. is really is really helpful and make sure make make the secondary operator you know able to. Uh, able to uh, to perform this procedure independently afterward. 20 cases, I think, in someone who already have intervention experience and have done uh, trans transeptal and have done, you know, uh, mitral, valve, mitral valve intervention, 20 cases would be probably more than enough. Uh, for Let's say for uh, my partner, uh, a surgeon who was learning, learning transcatheter skills from scratch, maybe 50 cases or maybe 100, because it depends on from where you start. Uh, yes. uh, that's why, you know, when you do a fellowship training that includes Mitra Clip, it becomes easier because you have exposed to Mitra Clip during fellowship. So doing it on your own and the practice becomes a quicker and, and the learning curve will become uh, shorter. Yes. For you, so, Ozge, also for imaging, uh, is a 3D echocardiographer uh, well equipped and in terms of experience to perform the very procedural management of mitral clip or does it need a specific training regarding the image well uh, to my opinion uh, for each kind of structural heart disease imaging pre-procedural -pre and uh, intra-procedural and after procedural of course for the follow-up you need a specific uh, training for each procedure to my opinion uh, especially for mitral valve uh, because as uh, you all mentioned it's totally 3D echo uh, dependent and uh, you have to see different cases as well because it's it looks the steps actually look like simple but the procedure itself is not simple at all uh, sometimes things go bad sometimes it really takes a long time even three four hours and uh, your image quality is uh, getting worse it's getting worsened and worsened because of uh, TO, TOE probe is getting, uh, you know, warmer. And uh, so the image quality is uh, worsening. So you are getting tired. Your concentration is going down. It's not simple at all, I can tell you. So you have to see many different cases at a high volume center to, to, to know, to learn how to deal with complications and uh, how to deal with image quality, uh, how to provide the best images. Uh, so it's a, it's a one hour procedure in your cath lab or no. Or longer than one hour? I think it's uh, approximately one an hour, one and a half and two hours uh, and between. Two hours. Yeah, but, but I, saw, your... I, I saw cases which take Three hours, four hours as well. Wow, Abdel I think uh, Ozgi, oh, no. the learning curve uh, uh, regarding the imaging, maybe just before and after the cat lab, not only in the cat lab. Uh, so uh, I think it, uh, for imaging, it may be uh, shorter uh, than um, the interventionist who uh, need to. Uh, um, practice uh, uh, actually uh, within the cases. I yeah. mean, uh, um, but you can, yes. you can you can you can uh, practice um, uh, or learn uh, the mitral valve as a, a complex apparatus uh, before, during, and after the case. 
But I want to ask uh, Abdul Qadir, <clears throat> you know, uh, we, we don't have uh, uh, yet uh, this uh, intervention uh, modality in Egypt, uh, but uh, as Zahran mentioned, most of uh, uh, interventional culturalists in Egypt is uh, clever in mitral uh, uh, valvuloplasty. Uh, uh, we can uh, do it uh, in about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, do the, the uh, just to get the access, do the septostomy and uh, across the valve and do the ballooning uh, and sometimes less than 20 minutes. So I think the, uh, uh, but we have the cost as a problem in Egypt, right. actually uh, so much more than you mentioned, you and Ozgi, not just uh, as we, we, we get told by the companies, and thirty thousand dollars or twenty-five thousand euro. Uh, that is actually the cost of Tavi in Egypt or Taver in Egypt, but the clipping is <laughs> much I more. Think, yeah, I, I I think I agree with you. The learning curve for for uh, for physicians in in in, uh, in in that region in Egypt and and Turkey probably going to be shorter when they have access to the device. But the problem is that the companies probably will not sell the device cheaper because there is no much volume of cases because you, you, yes. the company uh, reason is it's becoming cheaper because we have tons of cases done in every hospital every day. When the procedure yes. become very common and become very popular, the price will go down. And the company, if it comes to Egypt, will know that they will not sell much of it. So they will keep the price very high, I guess. Um, but I, I, I'm optimistic that there may be more devices coming out. Now there's the one device called Pascal. Pascal actually, uh, it's a group in Europe last week. So uh, uh, as, as, as a Meister Clip, com Meister Clip uh, competitor for yeah. severe MR, degenerative MR, and basket come from Edwards, which is a tavern uh, company that sells Edward Valve. So I think in the next few years, we'll have more devices. Plus the clip now is being studied and maybe, maybe approved for, for a tricuspid valve in the next few, few years. Yeah. Tri tri Triclip. So what happened, the clip now would be used for both. Uh, it's, it's called bi bi valve, you know, mitral and tricuspid. Mm. Uh, we we, we can uh, get you uh, inviting you and the Ozgi to do the first cases in Egypt. Uh, if you, Absolutely, uh, we would love to. I would love to come and uh, and do workshop there anytime, and uh, that will be my great pleasure. You know, absolutely. For me too. We are honored. Actually, yeah, actually, yeah. actually we we had the, we had the mitral clip in Egypt already for the past uh, four years and we had a program it was ongoing but with, but after the current situation and everything happened the problem is that it became uh, nearly triple price so it was uh, very expensive but beforehand we had it in a couple of hospitals and we had mm -hmm. workshops about it uh, what I want to ask actually uh, is, uh, and and by the way, and, 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 and by the way, let me mention this for the cost. When you compare mitral clip cost, look at the surgery cost. And and yes. not uh, you see, people say surgery is cheap, but it's not cheap because uh, surgery, we look hospital at, stay, ICU, rehabilitation, yes. everything. We look at the tavern and the and, and the tavern and the uh, sever. We found out that actually at one year, tavern is cheaper than surgery and less invasive and patient go home instead of going to nursing home and avoid sternotomy, avoid you know staying for a week or two in the hospital, surgical complications. So, so when you count this cost, people ignore that surgery is not also uh, uh, cheap or free. So surgery also yeah. costs. What I want to ask you about, do you have any experience in your center about uh, the transcatheter mitral valve replacement procedure? Or have you do, done any cases of those or involved in any studies about them? So the only cases I've done at transcatheter mitral valve replacement, which is TMVR, is actually yeah. mitral valve in valve, or yeah. valve in ring or valve in MAC. So yes, the, 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 yes, the, the aortic, uh, the uh, uh, yes, you can use it. Yes, so we use the Sabian in valve in valve and Sabian valve in MAC or valve in ring. So somebody has severe MAC, so we can ha hang in the valve, or mm -hmm. they have a severe, you know, uh, or they have a ring, or they mm -hmm. have yes. a previous failed surgical valve. Actually, I was consulted yesterday about a patient with, with failed, failed mitral valve. 
we go transeptal, we just need to reverse the valve, the Sabian over the balloon in opposite direction, uh, opposite to the aortic uh, you know, uh, yes. positioning. Yes. And we do it valve in valve. It's a very simple procedure, very, very safe, except we need to make sure we have good LVOT outflow. We don't cause any obstruction when you do the valve in valve. Now there's a trial going on for native valve with a, with a new device uh, specifically for mitral. It's called Intrepid uh, from Medtronic, and they do it uh, transapical. So you go you go through the apex and put a mitral valve and go out. And also Abbott has an, another valve called Tendine, which is also done uh, done uh, transapical, but also trying to find a way to do it transeptal, where those can be placed on those patients with severe MR whether it's primary or secondary, um, without need for like a MAC or ring or surgical, a native valve. Uh, and I think in five years, we will have the TMVR as a routine practice like we have TAVR now. Actually, yesterday we have a friend, uh, a cardiac surgeon. Uh, he get annoyed as long as we mention a left main stenting, uh, et cetera. Uh, we, we have to uh, thank God he is not with us uh, now because act actually surgeons will uh, no more have any jobs uh, in this world. Haysam, uh, Haysam has a question, so please, uh, yes. Haysam, uh, you have the mic. Thank you so much. Uh, at the mention of uh, volume and indication, uh, I've noticed that all your uh, cases were uh, having a high SPS score and uh, they are uh, highest for surgery. If there is any emerging indication for patients with intermediate or low risk surgery doing mitral clip in your practice? Uh, uh, or uh, this, well, well, uh, this Yeah, question? so this is a very good question. Patient come to my practice, they want mitral clip, uh, even if they're young, you know, they don't want open heart surgery. But I cannot do it because insurance only pay for the indication that's approved by the by the by the FDA and Medicare. Currently, we have no indication to do low risk patients. Although the patient wanted it, patient doesn't want to have surgery. They tell the surgeon, you know, can you refer me to mitraclib? But I cannot do it because we don't have an indication. I, I think there's some trial now. Trials will go on, uh, similar to what happened in Taver. We started with high risk and then intermediate risk and now low risk. In the next few years, we'll see a trial for mitraclib and low risk. I have no doubt it will be successful, but it has to happen again. It has to happen first. And then we have a data, and then we have indication by FDA, and then expanding indication by FDA and by, um, by uh, 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 insurance companies. Uh, but that has to wait for the clinical trial because uh, in US, they base their decision based on science, and science is not there yet. Last question. Uh, I know that the mitral clip is a very safe uh, procedure, uh, but uh, complication happens uh, every now and yeah. then. So, um, what's the precautions that you're taking in order to uh, avoid the complications? This is a very good question. You know, this is a very good question. And uh, so, um, the studies showed that the complication rate in uh, in the uh, uh, most mitral clip trial is about. 5% maybe. The majority of complication I've ever seen myself or I have witnessed or you know seen actually happen in the axis. So so it's not it's not uh, you know may, uh, that's that's number one. Axis should be perfected by using ultrasound, making sure you get uh, the right spot in the femoral vein, and make sure you get hemostasis good at the end of the case by doing either whatever it takes, uh, uh, brick close or figure of eight suture, manual compression, whatever method you choose, you, because bleeding is a still a risk for this 24th French axis procedure, number one. Number two, sometimes I've seen in the early, my experience, I've seen when I'm doing transeptal, I have seen clots happening on the wire, you know, uh, because patient is not fully anticoagulated on the fear of, of tamponade happening during transeptal. So we kind of uh, get over this by starting early heparin. After I get access, I give heparin full dose, so I don't have any clot on the wire anymore. And uh, using Bayless, Bayless is a safe technique for transeptal, the risk for pericardial fusion or tamponade goes minimal, even if you are fully anticoagulated. So, so those are the two uh, very uh, you know, um, commonly seen complications in my practice. Uh, Again, there's other complications related to the mitral clip itself, 
including a, a possibility of CLIB, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, detachment, as Ozgi mentioned, whether it could be partial or could be complete detachment. And uh, in those cases, you can use a snare to, 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 to get the CLIB out if, if, if it's still, if it's still uh, you know, uh, possible, or you can do surgery. I, I haven't seen any kind of those cases yet, but it's possibility. You see those cases when you go to conferences. So uh, again, if you, you're careful with the, with the grasping and you're sure with your echo, uh, like when I do a case, I always ask my echo uh, partner to measure the leaflet uh, length, anterior and posterior. And if they are too short, I would not do the clip. I have to make sure I have enough posterior leaflets. Because if you do it on a short, short, short uh, leaflet, you might get detachment. Number two, when I when I when I grasp the leaflet, I want to make sure how much tissue I'm grasping. At on least both, five millimeters. Yeah. Exactly on both sides. Uh, at least I have five millimeter grasp on both sides. Otherwise, if you are grasping one millimeter, maybe the clip will detach tomorrow or detach next week. So yeah. you have to make sure you grasp too much tissue. Uh, so the, the complication rate is very low, uh, and especially after the learning curve goes higher. Uh, I think if you do five, six, case, six cases a month, that's really high volume in US, five six cases per month. Uh, and uh, as you know, the learning curve will improve and you learn from mistakes, of course. Of course. By the way, I want to add something important. Um, we talked about the fellowship for this structural heart disease imaging. And before, uh, before trying to learn MetroClip or any other uh, interventional uh, imaging, you have to know 3D imaging very well because otherwise, you know, uh, if you Posting don't know 3D, time. yeah. <laughs> and of course, you have to know first 2D echo very well, <laughs> then 3D, yes, and afterwards structural heart disease imaging. And of course, uh, CT and CMR are the very important complementary tools for structural heart disease especially for the new transcatheter muscle valve uh, replacement era, CT will have an uh, utmost importance, as we all know. And for, for the mitral clip, after, for example, uh, in the follow-up period, if you are not sure about uh, residual mitral regurgitation, for example, because it's multiple jets, and it's really not easy to evaluate if it is a residual, severe, or moderate, okay? And because uh, the... Um, the device itself creates some acoustic shadowing as well. It's not easy at all. But uh, of course, first we can go with the TOE to evaluate it better. But of course, CMR is a perfect tool uh, with a high accuracy and reproducibility. Okay, if we are not sure about it, we have to, uh, we can carry on with cardiac MRI as well to evaluate the residual MR. So this was a question also I got, so you be, uh, it is well known and well established that this clip or this device is MRI friendly. So yes. you can perform a CMR because it's not uh, something yes. uh, that yes. would be interfering with a magnet or something, it's a MRI friendly device. Yes, it is. For all types of MRI machines, not essentially specific types of machines. Yeah. Yes, but of course we all know that with uh, 1.5 Tesla, yes. it's, it's much better in terms of artifacts. Yes, the one point. Uh, before uh, uh, Zahran give us the final uh, wrap up, uh, I have a final comment. I think the interventional uh, imaging uh, consultant like Ozgi is a pilot and uh, the interventionist uh, is a sniper. So uh, you, you have to have a very good uh, pilot before you get your shot. Uh, <laughs> Um, I want to thank you, to thank both of you, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Ozik from Turkey and Dr. Abdul Qadir from USA. Uh, I really enjoyed this webinar, my friends and the YouTubers also. And, uh, I will pass the mic to my dear friend Zahran to wrap up this uh, session. So, uh, thank you everyone for attending with us tonight. Uh, the YouTube uh, audience uh, extend their warmest thanks to Dr. Uzge and Dr. Abdel Qadir for this uh, really, really uh, scientific session. The science was uh, so heavy, actually, but both of you gave it uh, very smoothly. We did not feel uh, something really difficult or something so unfriendly or something uh, that's uh, strange or peculiar to us. No, 
it feels something very easy that we all uh, understand now in a very nice and demonstrative way. Thank you, Osgi, for your lovely lecture and for your lovely etch art. And, it was uh, my pleasure. I enjoyed a lot and I learned a lot. Learned Sharing a lot knowledge is always nice and important for me. Yes. And of course, my dear brother, Dr. Abdelkader, thank you so much, so much. My pleasure, and thank us. you so much for taking the initiative. And you know, and, and effort, it's very yes. great. We have to do more, hopefully. I'm looking for a tavern session, inshallah. Yes, we will. <laughs> me too, me too. It's <laughs> one of my favorite topics. Yes, so, okay, yes. Okay, so both of thank you, you are, so booked, much. are booked already. <laughs> <laughs> we will make the tavern session in the next uh, week or inshallah. couple of weeks, I will inform you. Inshallah. So also, it's very nice. Uh, I'm very, uh, I'm very thankful for all the audience with us from all over the world on the YouTube. Uh, thanks for uh, Dr. Abdurrahman Gamal, uh, Ahmed Saeed, uh, Haysan Suleiman, Karim Mahmoud for moderating with us today, and hopefully we will see you uh, after this uh, Eid al-Adha vacation. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. Every, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye bye. Bye. bye.